Hi everybody, this is the recorded lecture for hydrologic engineering on Monday the 8th of April. Um, so regarding the design project number one, this is the part of the a project where you are going to be doing a watershed analysis and then sizing a uh, partial flume. And then in a separate part of that project, you're going to be looking at putting in a culvert and analyzing and designing it with HY8. That assignment should be uploaded to Blackboard no later than 11.59 on Monday the 8th. And then um, following that, I'm going to give you design project number two. It's not available yet because you need to focus on project number one. But as we learn more about StormCAD, which is the subject of today's class, and then also talk about pond design basics, then you'll have the tools you need to do that project. And that'll be due on the last day of class, the 19th of April at 11.59 p.m. And then as I mentioned already, our final exam is during the last exam day of the semester, the last class period available. So our final exams from 12.45 to 2.45. So go ahead and schedule that in your calendar. We'll talk more about the specifics of the exam in a future class period. Um, today's video is uh, a first overview of how to use StormCAD. And so uh, for this recording to make any use to you, for it to be valuable whatsoever, you need to install the software and follow along with what I'm doing. So it's that same network that we looked at last Friday using Excel. So um, it's the same pretty simple two catchment, two pipe network with a single outfall. But we're going to be designing it with StormCAD rather than with the spreadsheet. Um, so please pause the recording, work through, do the same keystrokes as me, get some experience using the software because when we get together in class on Wednesday, I'm going to have a more sophisticated and complex example for you to work through. And if you're just using the program for the first time and you get stuck and don't know what you're doing, it's going to be a whole thing. So you need to have this initial example done to uh, be ready for Wednesday's class. Now, before we get into that, I wanted to show you some pictures of a partial flume. And I had somebody stop by my office last week and ask a question, so have you actually ever seen a partial flume? And if you've never seen one before, you may think that there are these obscure things that so rarely are used, but the answer is yeah. I've, I've seen them on lots of previous occasions, mostly out west. Um, I've got friends and family and sometimes vacation in the western part of the United States. And so if you go to places that have uh, irrigated agriculture where it doesn't rain enough for the crops and they have to, you know, direct water onto fields, you'll see partial flumes there. Uh, this is a photo that I took a couple of years ago up near Leadville, Colorado. And so I was hiking in the mountains and just uh, by serendipity came across this uh, flow measurement station. You can see that there is a transmitter which is sending electronic readings of the flow rate to a receiver station and the data is put up online. And so um, this is the partial flume. We're looking upstream. So the water's coming from this direction. You can see it's flowing out of the flume. And immediately after the flume, they have a pretty significant drop in elevation so that the tailwater is never interfering with the free flow through the flume. So we've talked about the need to avoid submergence of the hydraulic jump in the flume in order to get the most accurate measurements and also to avoid having to apply a correction factor. So when you put a flume like this in place, they've selected a spot where immediately after the flume, the water's flowing down a hillside and isn't going to have any kind of water backing up. So this is uh, looking upstream, and I'll show you a picture that I took a little bit more zoomed in on the, uh, the flume itself. You can see over here to the left, there is a measurement um, from the bottom. You could manually measure the H sub A. So this is the depth in the converging section. This is the section where the, uh, the water is flowing through a, a channel that's becoming successively narrower. Here's the throat. So the throat is where the hydraulic jump happens, but it's actually in the converging section that we would measure the depth of flow and calibrate that to know what the flow rate through the flume is. And um, here's just looking at it downstream 
to illustrate that the water um, is immediately discharged kind of off the side of a hill. So they do exist out in the real world. You can just stumble upon them when you least expect them on a hiking expedition. So I thought that was pretty interesting. The rest of this video is going to be focused on StormCAD. And of course, this is a recording from a previous offering of the course. And so I'll be uh, talking to students and uh, I may make some ancillary references to times or uh, dates that don't quite line up. But of course, if you do have any questions, you can always send me an email. The main thing about this lecture is working through the example using StormCAD. Okay, here is an outline of the workflow and I've handed this slide out to you in case you want to take some notes on it. This isn't included in the lecture notes that's the the PDF. I just put this together today after I was working through the demo um, just so that you could remember what are the steps that ought to be followed when you're setting up a model. And here is the system that we're going to size and we already looked at the same system when we were doing the spreadsheet problem. Um, so we're going to see if we get a similar answer as we did with that spreadsheet. There's two basins, a smaller basin and a larger basin. You can see that we've got two pipes in our system, a catch basin where all of the water from the smaller basin goes into catch basin one, and then the water goes through pipe A, and so water is entering catch basin two from two locations. Water's coming into that. It's like basically a concrete vault with a grate at the top that rainwater flows in from the top from this surface flow. And then there's an inflow pipe to that concrete vault and an outflow pipe to that concrete vault. So you can see that the slopes and the lengths of each of those pipes are given, but we don't know what diameter is required in order to convey all of the flow. And so the example that we're going to look at is we're going to see what pipe size would be required in order to make it big enough to capture the 10-year storm. There's a couple of assumptions you need to be aware of. And one of them is we're going to assume that this grate that we put in can capture all of the flow that comes off of the parking lot, just for simplicity's sake. But I want you to be aware that um, that may not always be the case because there's different grate sizes and lengths. And so we're going to assume that this is like in a low point of the watershed and all of the water that goes to it is ultimately going to get into that catch basin. In reality, if a grate is along a road, and let's say that the, the street is on a slope, the water may flow over the grate and only a, a fraction of it would go down through the grate and into the vault and some of it would continue onward. Um, so inlets aren't always 100% efficient at intercepting the flow, but we're going to assume and set it up so that they are 100% efficient. We also have ground elevation and invert elevations that we'll need for this example. The slope that's specified here, you can't specify slope directly in StormCAD. Instead, it determines the slope based on the length that you tell it and the elevation of the pipe at each end. So we won't, you'll, you'll notice there's no place we tell it the, the, length, uh, the pipe slope, but rather it gets that from the invert elevation. Ten-year storm, here is a uh, precipitation depth table. These are not intensities. These are depths. And so um, there's a, a couple of different ways to specify the storm data in StormCAD, and we'll look at two of those methods today, and uh, the one that we'll ultimately use for our problem will rely on these depths. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and start up StormCAD, and I think I'll probably need to get the Connect client logged in and running if it's not already. Looks like it remembered me. I don't have to log in again. That's a plus. Never sure how to get rid of that thing. All right, so we're going to create a new hydraulic model. If you're at this same screen, just click on the, the middle button there. 
And it's probably going to prompt us to say, do we want to track changes effectively? And we'll say no to that. We don't necessarily need all of our adjustments tracked with this model, so no. All right, so if you look at the workflow, it says first thing is to draw the elements. And so what we're going to try and depict is a schematic that summarizes this network. Two catch basins followed by an outfall. And so here is the button layout that you use to begin drawing. See the layout tab, we're on the home and then layout. And if you move the cursor down into the drawing window, it's going to start off with this circular symbol, which is for a manhole. And we don't want to drop a manhole. We want to drop a catch base. And so I right clicked to bring up this menu. So moving the cursor around, right click, catch basin. And then just drop one, two catch basins. And then right click again and choose outfall. Left click and then escape. So we should end up with two of these squares connected to a triangle. So it's catch basin one, catch basin two, outlet one. You'll notice that it's automatically named the pipe conduit one and conduit two, which is fine for now. We're going to update that and adjust it. Any questions so far on what we've done? This is a top view that we're looking at. This isn't a side view. So it doesn't really matter where you click because we're going to go in and tell it the length of these pipes. It has a scaling system. If you notice down at the bottom, it has X and Y coordinates. So if you had a picture in the background, you could drop these catch basins at the location intended on a map. And so you could make a scaled system based on a drawing in the background. But uh, for this first example, we'll just override any length that it is inferring from where we clicked. We just mean for this to be a uh, schematic. Any questions before we move on? OK, so we've, we've drawn the elements. Let's move on to part two of the workflow, conduit properties. And there's a couple of different ways to, to change the properties. One is if you use the select button. So now you've just got this pointer and you double click on something, so if you double click on the pipe, it will bring up its properties this way. It has a lot of properties. It's a very long list, most of them not applicable yet because we haven't calculated any hydraulic scenario. But it's more um, efficient if we edit all of the properties at once rather than on an individual one by one basis. And so instead of just like double clicking and bringing up its properties for that individual pipe, it's better to open up the flex tables. And so you'll notice this button across the top with the drop down arrow. If we choose the conduit flex table, it brings up this menu and it has both of the pipes. So now we could edit the properties of both of them. So for instance, changing the label from conduit one, I could label that pipe A, which is the label that was on the drawing. And as soon as I type enter, it updates the annotation that exists on that sketch already. And so then the other one, I'm going to call pipe B to be consistent with the, uh, the description that was on this sketch, pipe A, pipe B. So Likewise, we're going to be able to adjust the length of the pipe. So if we scroll over, right now it thinks the length of pipe A is 184 feet. And that's just based on like where I clicked in the window. So that's not the right length. What I need to do is tell it to not look at that and use a user-defined length. And so there's this checkbox here that says, has user-defined length. I'm going to turn that on. And you'll notice that it's going from yellow to white in the length field. So that now I can put in my own known lengths of 450 feet for pipe A and 600 feet for pipe B. So that we've done that through the user defined lengths. All right. You'll notice it has uh, the section type is circular. 
It's got a default Manning's N value of 0 0.013, which would be for a relatively smooth concrete. Um, I think that the, uh, the example suggests that the N values are 0 0.014. So let me make that adjustment. So the N value, I'm going to just change it to 0 0.014 for both of those. And instead of 12 inch diameter, I already know that that's a little bit small for these areas. Let's just change it to 15 inches for both of them and see how that does. All right, so keep scrolling to the side. Okay, I think that's all we need to have so far. Once we put in a uh, characteristics of the watershed, that goes to these catch basins. And once we click the compute button, a lot of these like flow, velocity, depth, that stuff will fill in once we've calculated the scenario. But so far, we've just told it the physical characteristics of the pipe. Any questions before we move on to the uh, catch basin properties? OK, so we've defined the conduit, which is just another word for pipe. Now let's go into the flex table for the catch basin. Just like before, I could, if I wanted, I could just double click, and that would bring up the properties of one catch basin. But it's better, I think, especially for a complicated network, if you bring up the flex table and see it all in tabular form. All right, so I think uh, the labeling that I had for the catch basins was I just called it CB1 with no dash. So CB1 and CB2. That was pretty close to begin with. Ground elevation. Ground elevation doesn't go into the hydraulic calculations, but it will give you warning messages if the ground elevation is too close to the top of the pipe. So it's useful to have the ground elevation in there uh, just so that you avoid the mistakes. And on the handout I gave you, it says that the ground elevation at Catch Basin 1 is 100 feet. And at Catch Basin 2, it's 95.5 feet. And then we also have the invert elevation. That is the bottom of the pipe that's coming in or out of the Catch Basin. It's going to set the pipe elevation equal to the invert. Invert elevation means it's this concrete vault where the top of the vault is at the roadway surface. The bottom of the vault is some distance below that. So the invert elevation to catch basin one is 95, and the invert for catch basin two is 90.5. All right. I don't think that you have inlet location on yours. If you scroll over to the side, does yours say inlet location? No. OK. So the way that you add that is this yellow button for edit here. Scroll down on the list on the left until you find inlet location. And once you've got it, click on this add button, the, the one on the top, the single arrow to the right. And then what that'll do is it'll add that column to what you view in the catch basin table. And the reason why we need to have that inlet location on our list is we're going to tell this that this inlet is in a sag. And that's a way of forcing it to assume that all of the water in the assigned watershed goes into the catch basin. If, it was, uh, if it's in a sag, then that just means it's like at the bottom of a low point in the watershed. And so all of the water will get into that grate. This program has so much sophistication that obviously we can't get into every function in a 50-minute class demo. And part of the functionality it can have is calculating how much interception there is as the water's flowing over the top of a grate. It'll be able to calculate based on the shape of the grate, the width. There's these standardized patterns that even have different angles of the openings. It can calculate how much of the water is going to get in there. But uh, just for simplicity's sake, we wanted to assume that all of the water gets into that. And so set the inlet location to sag. Has everybody done that? OK, so once you got that specified, we're done with these catch basin properties. We can close this menu. 
Next, we're going to define the outfall properties. And so open up the flex table to the outfall. And uh, I think we called this, instead of O1, it was OF1. Not much of a difference. But let's give it the ground elevation, which from the table on the handout says it's 93.1. The invert, the bottom of that junction is 88.1. And I don't think there's anything else that we specify for the outfall. Okay, so we specified that. You can close it. Okay, we haven't yet defined any catchments. You'll notice that step five on this workflow is the catchment properties. We need to draw the basins, the actual watershed. So if we go back to the sketch to look at it, we've got this watershed is 1.5 acres. This one is 3.2. So this is just a schematic that we're putting together, and we need to represent those two basins. And the, where we do that is here in the Layout tab. We've been mostly in the Home tab so far, but switch to the Layout tab. And here's this green button at the top, the Catchment button. So click on that, and when you bring your cursor down into the drawing window, you can tell that now you're going to start sketching out just a symbolic representation of the catchment. Remember, this isn't a scaled map that we have in the background. If, if you did have like a design drawing of the project area, you could trace the boundaries of the catchment, and it would calculate the area that way. But in the same way that we manually told it what was the length of the pipe, we're going to do the same thing here with the area of the catchment. So I just need to trace some shape so that it knows I'm going to double click, right click, done. You just trace some shape. It doesn't really matter where it is. It doesn't even have to be on top of the basin necessarily because we're going to link it. We're going to tell it the relationship of which catchments go into which catch basins. So just to illustrate that, here I'll draw this one above. But I'm going to define that the water from this watershed goes into catch basin one. The water from this catchment goes into catch basin two. So we've drawn the catchments. And now let's go into the flex table for it. Does anybody need help with drawing the catchment? Sometimes that can be tricky because of the right click at the end to make it done. Anybody need a moment, some assistance? OK. So assuming that we've got all this drawn up to now, then in the Home tab, in the Flex Tables, open up the Catchment Flex Table. And this is where we put in all of the watershed properties. So if we look at what we had in this original drawing, we didn't have a specific name for either of the catchments. So we'll just go with the default. But we know the area in acres the time of concentration in minutes, and the C value. So let's just translate that over. Uh, first, the area in acres. So it says here a user-defined area. So 1.5 acres is for the first area, and it was 3.2 acres for the second. The runoff coefficient, that's the C value. So 0 0.075 and 0 0.55. Now look at the units for time of concentration. It says hours in that table. When, how do you, what units do you have in the example? Minutes. Minutes. So, I mean, it's not like uh, rocket science to make the conversion between minutes and hours. But if you had like three or four dozen uh, catchments, it would be more convenient just to be able to type it in as minutes rather than have to do the calculations. And so you can change the units that it's using. So here on time of concentration, put your cursor on that column heading and right click and units and formatting. So right now it's on hours. Let's change it to min, which means minutes. And we don't need it to have like three decimals afterwards. So we could just have like one decimal. OK. So now I can type in the minutes. And so I had that it was uh, 10 minutes for the smaller watershed, 
and a time of concentration of 30 minutes for the larger watershed. Okay, so in the mind of this model, it still doesn't know which catchments are connected to what catch basins. We haven't yet defined that linkage, even though like it's closest to, you know, like this was drawn on top of catch basin one, it doesn't assume based on that, that that's where the water's going. You have to tell it. And that's what this outflow element column is for. So if you click in the outflow element, it has this ellipsis, the dot, dot, dot. So click on that, and now it's saying, OK, so tell me, where does the water go? Select it on the drawing. So it's, it's asking you to click on one of the catch basins. So I'm going to click on catch basin one. And so now it knows that the outflow element for catchment one is catch basin one. So the same thing for catchment two. I click down in that field, click on the ellipsis, and then it's highlighted here in red, it's asking, where does the water go from this watershed? And I say it goes into catch basin two. And now that dashed line kind of is our visual representation. The model knows where the water will be entering the pipe network. OK. Think about, this is using the rational method. Q equals CIA. What haven't we told the program yet in the rational method? It's going to calculate Q, but what didn't we tell it? CIA. What doesn't it know yet? The intensity. The intensity, right. It knows C and it knows A because we just put those in here. These time of concentration, it's going to use that in determining the intensity, but it still needs to know what do the rainfall patterns look like in this area. So we're going to define as our next step here, step six, storm data definition. Okay, so go here to storm data and the storm data option. So click on that. It's going to bring up a dialog box of a couple, of, well, there's lots of options here. The two I want to show you today is, first of all, a user-defined IDF table. So if I do new user-defined IDF table, it opens up this. You'll notice it created an entry down here. But let me add a return period. Let's say that I want to put in the 10-year storm in here. And so now I'm going to add durations. And let's say, for instance, that I know the storm duration for um, the five minute duration of the storm, add the duration with the 10 minute, 15, Thirty and sixty. I wonder if this range would have made it so that I could do that all at once. But all right. So now what I need to tell it is I need to tell it what is the intensity of the storm for the five, ten, fifteen, thirty, sixty. This is what you'll be doing for the homework, and the data is on this handout I'm going to give you. So for example, the five-year storm, or excuse me, ten-year storm, five-minute duration has an intensity of 5.4 inches per hour. 4.2. 3.2, 2.3, and 1.4. So this is the curve for the 10-year storm that tells you if you know the return period, what will be the intensity of the storm. So uh, we could tell Storm StormCAD to use this as how it's going to find out the intensity. Is there anything I need to show again for this user-defined IDF table? Anything? I went too quick through, I could show again. Where, where did you get your, uh, your storm data? It oh, it's, it's on the homework handout I'm going to give you. Oh, so okay. it's nothing that you've got in front of you. Okay. Yeah, just mimic what I've got okay. for now. But I will give you on the assignment what, what storm you should use for the design problem. So Hydro 35 is another option. So let's create a Hydro 35 storm to use. So here this new 
Hydro 35. What it does is if you put in the two year and the 100 year storm, and if you put in the five, 15, and 60 minute duration, then it'll interpolate everything in between. It's gonna interpolate the five, 10, 25, 50. And it's gonna interpolate durations like 10 minutes, 30 minutes. It's, there's just like these typical scaling relationships that it will use. Uh, so on the handout I gave you, this is the third slide where it has, this is the depth for the two year, five minute is 0.419. Now, the 15-minute duration, two-year, 0.799. Boy, that is a little bit blurry. The 60-minute duration is 1.31. Okay, now we'll put in the 100-year storm. The depth for the five-minute is 0.755. For the 15-minute is 1.41. And for the 60-minute is 2.73. So you'll notice it has this kind of scaled, extrapolated IDF curve. So we've created two different storms that we could have the program look at. Like when we say compute, we're going to tell it what storm to assume is coming through our network. So we could size the storm for like a we could size the pipes for a 10-year storm, and then we could say, well, let's see how it does when it's just a two-year storm. Or we could run a different simulation after we've finalized our design. Okay, so we've defined the storm data. Any questions before we move on to step seven, which is compute? Okay, so we close that. This green button, compute. Just click the green button. Fingers crossed we don't get a bunch of error messages. Let's see, there is a concern. Oh, we didn't tell it the storm to use. That is a big concern, yeah. So back to the storm data tab. We defined the storm events, but we didn't assign which one it should look at. Remember, there was lots of options. So I forgot to tell it whether to use the user-defined IDF table or whether to use Hydro 35. So if you click on global storm events, uh, the global storm event drop-down box, we have we can either use this user-defined IDF table or the storm data that was from the Hydro 35. Let's do the Hydro 35 10-year storm instead of that user-defined. So Hydro 35 10-year storm, close that. All right, now when we compute, hopefully we won't get a red exclamation mark here. I think it will have a concern based on the ground cover, but it won't be an error message. Uh, convergence was achieved. We like that. That means that uh, it finished its calculations. It thinks it knows what the depths are going to be. Convergence was achieved. So um, the only thing that comes up on the picture is just the flow direction. But obviously, we need to know more than that. Uh, let's look at these messages here. One or more conduits are operating under pressure. That is a sign that one of the pipes is too small that uh, it's undersized. Conduit discharge is above design discharge. That's, again, another thing that's telling us it's too small. And then a warning here, conduit does not meet minimum slope constraint. So the program has guidelines of what would be the, uh, the shallowest slope that would be acceptable. So you know, some towns really don't have a lot of options. They can't make the pipes any steeper simply because uh, they're flat towns. and the rivers at a certain elevation. Um, let's get into the flex tables and see what data we can get out of there. Any questions before we do? Okay, so open up the conduit flex table. Does it matter if we have different notifications from what you do? Uh, I don't know. What does your notification say? So I've got a minimum cover constraint as well. Yeah, that's not the end of the world. I got one that says one or more elements is flooding during this time. Okay. Yeah. One or more elements is flooding. So I think those all probably mean the same thing that the pipe is too small. So hopefully when we fit when we make the pipe B is too small, just to reveal that's the our problem pipe is too small. Once we make it bigger, I think those error messages will go away. The minimum cover won't though. The minimum cover thing is looking at the elevation. So 
Uh, you know how I said the ground elevation here, the invert elevation is there? It is thinking there's not enough uh, soil on top of the pipe. It's too close to the surface. So we would maybe have to rethink what elevations we use for the inverts. But for just for uh, getting a sense for how the model operates, I don't think any of those errors are fatal errors for now. So we'll just move on. Open up the conduit table. And if you scroll to the side, what you're going to see is some of those fields that were blank before in yellow now have flows calculated, velocities. I think I may have a typo somewhere. I'm expecting more flow for that, uh, that first pipe. Pipe A should have more flow than that, I would have expected. But you'll notice that pipe B is undersized. Look at the capacity of the pipe compared to the flow. So this is saying it calculated that there's 5.45 CFS that's entering that pipe, but it only has a capacity of 3.79. So you can see where that would be a problem. Josie, do you have a question? Yeah, my flows are 5.66 and 8.4. OK. The only difference would be in like your uh, Catchment. Let's open up the uh, catchment and see if I've maybe typed in. Uh, look at my C value, 0 0.075. So it's supposed to be 0 0.75. Let me recalculate. All right, I'll open up my conduit table. Okay, so let's look. So pipe A is at 94% capacity. That, so pipe A is, is sized OK, but pipe B is uh, it's way over capacity. Do you see this flow to design capacity ratio? That kind of gives you a sense for whether the pipe is too small or too big. There's lots of different ways to see it. You just compare the flow to the capacity and see that pipe A is all right, pipe B is too small. Could we make pipe A smaller? Like it's 15 inches right now. What if I tried to go down to 12 inches? Well, if I went to 12 inches, it's already calculating that I would be at 171% capacity. See how that changed this ratio of flow to design capacity? So I'll put that back at 15. 12 would be too small. Um, I won't be able to immediately see the new implications, like if I go from 15 to 18, it didn't automatically update this because I need to compute it again. So push the green arrow, and you can even leave the flex table open. Compute, OK, still not big enough. It's not as bad as it was, and some of our error messages went away. Like that error message about the flooding, element is flooded, we don't see that anymore. Uh, it is under pressure, but it's not flooded. I think what flooded must mean is that there's so much water there that um, it rises to the surface, that there isn't enough elevation difference for the pipe to be pressurized exclusively. OK, so pipe B still needs to be bigger. 18 wasn't large enough. Let's try 24 inches and calculate again. All right, I think that's going to do it. We're at 94% for pipe A and 63% for pipe B. Now, if there was a 22-inch pipe available for us to buy, we could try that. But uh, in this case, it's the 24-inch pipe. Like if we just had 15, 18, and 24, 36, then we'd be stuck using this 24. It's as close as we can get to optimal. OK, so that was. Step seven, compute. Any questions before we move on to annotate? Do you know what the word annotate means? Add labels. That's right. It's adding labels to the drawing. It already has a couple of labels. It's got the word pipe A. It's got the, the labels for CB and CM. But let's say we want more than that. So um, in the homework, I ask you to annotate the uh, catch basin label, we've already got that, CB1. The uh, outfall label, OF1, OK, that's good. And for the conduit, 
We want the conduit label, that's already there, but now the length. We want that to be in the drawing. So over here on the element symbology window, click the plus, and then right click on the word conduit, and new annotation. So again, what we're doing is over here on the left side of the screen, right click on the word conduit, new annotation, and um, the field name, scroll down to length user defined. Okay. And then for the prefix, I'm going to put L space equals, and let's see if I click apply what it does. Ah, look, it's right on top of the pipe. That's not real convenient. You can't see it very well. So this offset will push it down. So for the Y offset, do minus 6 and apply. And that brings it down off the center of the pipe to a better location. And maybe I want to put an extra space after the equal sign, too. There, and I like the way that looks a little bit better. You can still adjust the location of these annotations, but um, this initial offset can get things so it's not just all jammed on top of itself. OK, so we've got the length. What about the diameter? So click OK. Right click on the word conduit. New annotation. From this drop down box, choose diameter. There it is. And D space equals space. Now, I'm going to have to do a vertical offset. Let me do the Y offset of negative 12 and apply. OK, that seems all right. So we've got the diameter of each of those. I'm going to do another annotation. That is the flow. New annotation. And uh, scroll down the list to flow. We'll have Q space equals space negative offset of negative 18. Apply. There it is for the Q. Do another annotation, new annotation. The last one we'll have for our conduit is like an indication of the percent capacity. So the field name to scroll down, down to is flow divided by flow capacity. Flow divided by capacity, this one. And then for the prefix, I'm just going to call it percent. Uh, where's my percent? There it is, percent capacity equals. And I guess, where am I at for my offsets? Negative 18? Mm -hmm. uh, 24. All right. OK, so the pipes are annotated. Um, let's also annotate the catchments. So right click on the catchment, new annotation. Let's say I want it to have the area. So drop down box, area user defined. So A equals, and uh, I probably ought to do an offset of, let's try a negative 15, see where that ends up. Fine. OK, and then also the C value. Annotation. Um, runoff coefficient rational. So then I'll do C equals and uh, maybe negative 21. Hmm. OK. And once I get back to just my normal cursor, so up here, the select button, I can select these labels and move them around either as a group, like you can see now that I'm moving it as a group, or I could just pick one of them individually and move that one. Um, yeah, there it is. So if I felt like one of them was like right on the border where it was inconvenient, I could make adjustments just to improve the visual appeal of what I'm working on. Maybe some of you, it's not filling up the screen like mine. Like maybe some of you, it looks like that. 
Um, you're probably already familiar with a similar function here, zoom extents, maybe from AutoCAD or MicroStation. If you click on that, it's going to fill up the whole window. Let me show you how to uh, do a print of this. Last thing is um, if we go over here to File, Print, and leave it on Fit to Page. Let's do Page Setup. Just based on the shape of what I've done, I think it would be better as a landscape instead of portrait, you know, because I, ha I made it kind of long. It was more long than it was tall. So landscape would be better. And these margins, I'm not actually going to print it. I'm just going to make a PDF, so I might as well make the margins a bit smaller, half an inch. OK, OK. And then print preview. Let's see what that looks like. All right. So here's what my print preview looks like. And I'm going to do file, print, dot, dot, dot. And uh, let's see, Microsoft print to PDF. I want to make a PDF out of this. So I'm going to click print. And it may give me a location. Where do I want to save it? I'll just put it on my, uh, my jump drive here, StormCAD example. And the advantage of having a PDF is, like, if I just did print screen, like, if I, I'm going to push the print screen button right now, print screen. And if I paste that into a Word document, like that screenshot, it's not going to look very good, especially if I try zooming in. It's blurry, and the, the lettering is blocky. Do you see how that it does, just doesn't look that great? It doesn't have the same resolution as if I now take a look at that uh, PDF file that I just created, StormCat example. Um, the text is vector rather than raster, which means that you could zoom in some infinite amount, and it's still going to be sharp. Be even sharper if I opened up in uh, Adobe Acrobat rather than the internet browser, but you get better quality, I guess is what I'm saying, if you create a PDF. And so that's what I ask you to do on the assignment is um, print a PDF. One thing I'll mention is if you don't zoom extents, then your print is going to be a smaller part of the screen. So for example, if I was just zoomed out like, like, oh, that's too much. Let's say I was zoomed out like that, and now I do the print preview. My, uh, my print preview is going to be a smaller part on the page, like that. So when it's in this scaled mode, it's uh, important for you to do the zoom extents button so that your model is filling up the window, your drawing window. And then you will get, oh, not set up. Then you'll get your, uh, your print to fill in the majority of the printing space that's available. It's not perfect at it, but it does better. It's 1248. We're out of time. Um, so just a reminder, you know, like this demo has been recorded. So if there's a certain part that uh, I went through too quickly, you could watch it later. Or if you forget bef between now and when you do the assignment, you can watch it later. And um, feel free to stop by if there's something I can help you figure out. You can stop by my office, or you could give me a call on Teams and share your screen with me. I'm more than happy to help you out.